Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. And tonight, once again, we're going to go back into history. Our guest tonight is Charles Larimore, and uh, Charles is the author and filmmaker of both the book and movie Love and Valor. Charlie, welcome to the show. Uh, hello, Kevin. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think I just mispronounced your name just to get it off to a good start, right? It, Larimer. Larimer. Yes. So there we go. Now we're, now we're on a better footing. Good. So uh, well, let's, let's start with, um, I did both a book and a movie, and we'll get into a little bit of the differences between the two media, but uh, what's the basic story? It's, the basic story of Love and Valor is, uh, is the letters that my great-great-grandparents wrote to each other during the American Civil War. Uh, and they're very unique in that uh, both of them were great writers, but uh, very the, the most unique aspect of the letters are that they're Emmeline's letters, letters from a woman. Uh, a typical Civil War story, uh, mostly in book form, uh, would just be about battles and campaigns and leaders. Uh, women don't get mer uh, mentioned, children don't get mentioned, but a big part of the story uh, is what, what the women were doing during the Civil War in the small town in Iowa. And stories about the children. Uh, but in addition, uh, Jacob, my great-great-grandfather, was in a lot of the hot spots uh, in the Western theater during the Civil War. So it's a package that really includes a lot, a lot of very interesting military stories, but also stories about the home front and what the women were doing. And now it covers quite a time period as well, because wasn't your, uh, wasn't Jacob in, in the Army for a number of years, for most well, of the war? He was really in the war for the whole, the whole four years. Uh, he enlisted in, in the uh, uh, in Iowa um, regiment just before the start of the Civil War. So when the, the Civil War broke out, uh, he was in the 1st Iowa Infantry. They were ready for action. Uh, so and he, he went down to Missouri, and they, they chased after the uh, Missouri governor mm -hmm. for a while. Then he went back to Iowa and worked as a recruiting officer and re-enlisted, and then was in throughout the rest of the war. Uh, he was in the Vicksburg campaign. A lot of the Illinois regiments were also in the uh, Vicksburg campaign. Uh, so then after uh, Vicksburg, uh, they made their way up to Chattanooga. Uh, so he was up there, and then after Chattanooga, he was in the Atlanta campaign. Uh, some of the interesting parts about that, he was in a lot of the main battles from Gone with the Wind. So I've, I've during the course of all this, I've met some uh, interesting Gone with the Wind aficionados and tour guides. Then after uh, and the he came, and he came alive, right? He lived he, through the whole thing. He lived through the whole thing. A lot of his friends and relatives did not make it through. Mm -hmm. So uh, throughout the war, uh, he's dealing with the, the death and of, of, of a lot of friends and neighbors and. Right. Part of what happened during the Civil War is communities went to war. And, uh, in fact, families would go to war in the same regiment. The, ab absolutely. Uh, one of Emmeline's brothers was in Jacob's uh, company, and, and he did not survive. And So what, what happened, a, a company would have about 100 men. Uh, Emmeline knew a lot of these soldiers in Jacob's company. Eventually, he became a captain, and she knew their families back in Iowa, and Jacob knew the families. Uh, back in Iowa, in the, the Mount Pleasant area in there. Um, so a lot of the correspondence uh, would be about these other soldiers and their families and what's going on in this town. So the, the scope of letters goes way beyond just family correspondence. Well, and they're both very good writers. In fact, we have some, uh, we have some trailers from the film version of, of the story where you get a sense for how well the, the, the both of them could write. So um, actually, if we, if we have, we'd like to start with the letter from Jacob. Uh, as he writes back to his wife Emmeline. Um, so if we can, let's see if we can cue up that uh, that trailer and we'll get Jacob's letter to his wife Emmeline. This is a most horrible war to take me away from you for so long a time and to make it necessary to endure such dangers and labors as we both have felt on account of it. But you must not think that I regret that I entered the army or that I begrudge to my country for a moment all that I have done and suffered in trying to serve her. I have never felt so for a moment. No, my dear, if only through this baptism of blood, our nation, freed and purified from the blighting curse of slavery, shall lift her radiant forehead from the dust, and crowned with the wisdom of freedom, go on her glorious way rejoicing. I shall count my past suffering and shattered health only as a small dust in the balance compared with the priceless blessings of peace, freedom, and national unity which they may have contributed however slightly to purchase. 
only to have contributed something, however little, for the peace, something for the glory, something for the permanence of those beautiful and bright institutions which are the pride of the past and the hope of the future, will be a joy through life and a consolation in death. So what strikes me about that is, first of all, the well, in, in today's sense of writing and speaking, uh, it seems almost kind of over the top. It it's like, seems excessively flowery. But I, mean, I think going back 150 years, uh, that is how people wrote. That was a different way of expressing oneself. I, I think it really was. I think people viewed themselves and their role in society much differently than than they do now, especially someone in Iowa at that time, which was pretty much the ed edge of civilization, which is kind of hard to imagine, but it, but it really was in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, people really felt they were, they were part of the manifest destiny. They, they were part of this great thing known as the United States. Well, and you can hear that in, in Jacob's letter. He talks um, actually about things that you, you wouldn't expect a husband and wife to, today to really correspond about. Um, uh, he's talking about the, the great cause, and he's talking about how he feels about it um, in ways that, that seem almost like they're meant for publication rather than just as a, a letter just back and forth between spouses. I, I really think when he wrote that he was writing to a greater purpose. He was addressing the letters to Emmeline, but maybe back in the back of his mind, he knew that uh, in 150 years, <laughs> someone would, <laughs> yes. you know, one of his descendants may, would, would pick up on these things and say, this is really something uh, that the United States should see. It, it, to, to me, this really is a, a great American story. And at the time, he must have realized he was in a, in a great American story. And so as he wrote about it, he wanted to really convey that feeling and that sense of, he, of really historical importance. He, he did, and it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, he was in a lot of the hot spots, and he would write about that. But, but he, uh, he, he would write about America uh, in, at, at times. It, it, the book would remind me of On the Road. You're taking a, a guy from mm -hmm. Iowa, Midwestern small town, and he's suddenly in a lot of different places, and he's writing from the perspective of somebody from a small town, but seeing something glorious and different. Uh, one of the funny examples of that is when he's going through Georgia and he's, he's writing about the bugs in Georgia. And, and the bugs in Georgia really are a lot different than the bugs in Iowa and the bugs in Illinois. <laughs> right. Much, much bigger. He, something he'd never seen and had right. never had to deal with before. Right. And, 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 uh, and, and finally making it to Savannah at the end of Sherman's March to the Sea and seeing the ocean. You know, when you're in Iowa, you see the Mississippi rivers, which is exciting. But the Atlantic Ocean is even more exciting than the Mississippi River. And this was at a time when people really didn't travel much in the 1860s. Uh, people didn't hop on airplanes and fly across the country. And, and, I, and I think that fed into a lot of the interest of why so many uh, young men in Iowa and Illinois and the Midwest, part of why they wanted to join the service and travel is it, it was something so different. Mm -hmm. This is their, their one chance uh, they may have thought to go see different parts of the country, which, which sounds strange during wartime, but it, it, Jacob would travel through these places. He would write extensively about about what he would see, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in certain ways, he was almost a travel writer in the middle of the war. So let's hear from uh, Emmeline as well, because she stayed home and tended the home fires, so she had her own perspective, right? So let's see if we can cue up the letter from Emmeline and see her. tonight and what are you doing oh I would so like to know I've got the blues most horribly and the wind is blowing a perfect streak your old canteen is bumping and banging against the wall on the porch trying to keep time with the howling of the wind and the dismal patter of the rain oh how gloomy everything seems tonight how I wish you were here with us to chase away the melancholies but if you would only take Vicksburg and I could hear that you were all safe and well, I think I would come to my senses again. Oh, the suspense and great anxiety a person feels who has a dear friend in such a dangerous place. I do hope you will take all the care of yourself that is possible. 
Where are you tonight, and what are you doing? And so Emmeline approaches it with the same kind of literary feeling in her letters as though, yes, she's clearly writing to her husband, but as though others may read this at some point. I, and, and I think they both felt that way. And um, it was, uh, going back to how I found the letters, it was, uh, going back to 1920s and 30s, uh, my grandmother's sister typed the letters. And, and I heard stories oh, that the, the family took would, the handwritten letters and typed and them all up. Typed up Jacob's letters, and I heard that the family back in the 20s and 30s, my father and his cousins, and uh, their parents, would sit around and read the letters to each other. So it, uh, it was a, a very interesting form of family entertainment before television. But mm -hmm. the, but during their summer vacations, they would get together and read these letters to each other. So it almost goes back to the oral tradition, except that they're reading, but but recounting family history that would have been lost otherwise. Very much so, and, and so many of these stories are lost to people. And par part of what's exciting for me is to uh, jump back several generations and grab these stories that had missed several generations. Emmeline's letters had been lost. Uh, none of my relatives had ever mentioned anything about Emmeline's letters. And, and that was, in certain ways, the strangest of my finds. So how, how did they come to light? Well, I, I, uh, a lot of strange things happened during finding these letters, and uh, I frequently call them my ghost stories. <laughs> I, I quit for a while. My, my brother said, well, if you call them ghost stories, no one will take you seriously. <laughs> so I stopped, but it, it's a fun way to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, my most important ghost story is how Emmeline's letters found me. I say, they, they found me. I, I thought they didn't exist. I but, wasn't looking for them. But but you were you thought they might exist. No, you know, I, I really? didn't even think they would they existed at all. People who didn't know better would say, "Oh, go find Emmeline's letters." And I had been working on Jacob's letters for about five years, mm -hmm. and um, I'm very big into finding cemeteries and graves of people mentioned in the book. It's a very interesting thing. And, um, I was taking a trip out to Iowa, and I wanted to find the grave of Jacob's father. I have a great letter that he had written. Um, so I, and they'd lived near the town of Danville, Iowa, which is a small town between uh, about halfway between Mount Pleasant and Burlington. Mm -hmm. And I was on my way to uh, Midwest Threshers, which is like a county fair in Mount Pleasant. Uh, so I stopped in Danville and got directions to the local cemetery out in the country, about two miles from Danville. And uh, I was walking up and down the roads looking for the grave of Jacob's father. Whose name was? His name was Henry Rittner. Okay. Okay. And eventually I found Henry Rittner's grave, but right next to Henry's grave, I found the grave of Jacob and Emmeline's first child, Evangeline Rittner, uh, who had died in uh, 1852, about two weeks before her first birthday. Mm -hmm. And it, it really surprised me because I, I wasn't looking for that grave. And um, I, I knew that Jacob and Emmeline would have been standing there at a time of great grief. Uh, I had a picture of Emmeline and I knew that she was the love of Jacob's life, but I had not really made an emotional connection with her. But mm -hmm. it, it, at that moment where I, I knew I was in the country all by myself, that Emmeline would have been standing right there. Uh, I made an emotional connection with her. Her, her letters found me three days later. later. Uh, and what happened, they existed. Uh, clearly, uh, yes. They, they, uh, and very, very few women's letters survived the Civil War, but Emmeline's did. A Civil War collector out in Utah had copies of them, and he found me on a website where you could post your name and your Iowa Civil War soldier. Mm -hmm. he, and and he, he contacted me and uh, he wondered if I was the person who had given him the letters uh, many, many years ago. And I said no. And he, he was very gracious and he made copies of the letters. Uh, he had transcribed the first nine. Mm -hmm. I transcribed uh, the remaining 36 or so. And uh, every one of Emmeline's letters was dated so that when I was done transcribing them, I could put them right in between Jacob's letters. And when I did that, this, this wonderful flowing conversation emerged. So, and how many letters overall? There were the 45 of I, I think Emmeline's. 45 of Emmeline and about 110 of Jacob's letters. So it's, it's a very... That's uh, a pretty good record of it, correspondence. It, it really now, is. Now, how did this collector, he, or does he remember well, how, how he came yes, to these letters? Yes, well, it's a strange story. Go back to sometime around 1980, um, his mother, and, and the mother of my distant, a, a distant cousin of mine had copies of the letters. Um, 
the, the, the mother of the collector and the mother of the distant cousin met at a garage sale in New Mexico sometime around 1980. Mm -hmm. One of the mothers was hosting, and uh, they happened to be both outgoing women, so they started talking and then about their, their sons and then their son's hobby, which was the Civil War. So uh, d during that, there was an exchange uh, from my distant cousin to the Civil War collector. And, and, and now only in the age of the internet, right, would this connection between it, you and the collector right. have been made. That's right, and uh, I was very lucky. I have a lot of these strange stories, and then with the internet, I could make that final jump mm -hmm. in ways that I couldn't have uh, even 10, yeah, even years, ten years before right. that happened. Right. Remarkable. So, um, so your ghost story is that Emmeline reached out to you from the grave and that's said, "Hey, it, here's my I'm letters. still here, and here's my letters." Uh, that, that's how, that's how uh, I feel because it was such a stun, mm -hmm. a stunning moment. Just three days later, that uh, these letters, uh, I found about the letters, and so that's how you came upon, or that's how you started with the book. And so the book was published in about 2000. Is that that's right. right. Uh, and what prompted you then to try to? To want to make that into a movie. Well, I, I love movies, and I thought it would be a very easy process <laughs> to go from a book <laughs> to a movie. It turns out it's a very difficult process, but in certain ways, it was good that I didn't know how difficult it would be. You would never have attempted it, it had it's you like, known, well, right? Probably, but uh, it, making the movie was, was an awful lot of fun, and uh, in, th in, in making the movie, I, I learned uh, more things even about the story. Um, in making the movie, I spent a lot of time with Civil War reenactors. And uh, I, I just have to say, I love Civil War reenactors. These people were absolutely wonderful to me. I had uh, great cooperation all the way through. Uh, some of the funny stories are um, it, we would be filming something and we'd be setting up incorrectly, and the, the reenactors would come up and say, you know, you're not doing that right. That's not, not how it looked, not, not how, how it, it would have worked. You should do it differently. And we would always say, okay, tell us how we should do it. And we would listen and then do it the way they wanted to. Now, what's interesting, if you have interacted with the with the reenactors, is um, and not to digress too much from the story of your grandparents, but uh, what is it that motivates the reenactors? I mean, it's one thing to study history, but to reenact it seems like another step. And what what do they gain out of the reenaction that you don't get from just studying? Um, there's a huge amount of camaraderie, which I didn't realize. But th these people, uh, reenactors. Throughout the summer, every weekend there's a big reenactment. So mm -hmm. they'll they'll they may see each other in Kankakee, and then they, they may go see each other in Dubuque. Uh, so it's a fun thing for these people, um, and they're, they're getting outside and they're 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 doing fun things. And does and it, it allow them to? Uh, I mean, my guess would be you experience history in a different way if you, you really try to live it. You do, and that's uh, they do. They they camp in tents. Uh, dur during these weekends, and if it's miserable conditions, well, certain, for some of them, so much the better, <laughs> because that's exactly what the soldiers <laughs> would have gone through. Right. They gone through many years ago. Uh, uh, I read stories. There's a great book called Confederates in the Attic, which goes into reenactors, and mm -hmm. uh, some of the reenactors will refuse to use bug spray because they didn't have bug spray back in the uh, in the uh, well, if you want to experience what those guys went through, that would that, make that's sense. A, you know, bug bites were part of the package. Mm -hmm. So uh, they would do this. So, and, and you meet these people, and uh, I, I was continually impressed by how friendly and nice they were. And, so, and it sounds like they were very cooperative in the movie making as well. Extremely. One, I mean, one of the, we, we did one of the funny ones. We were doing some filming up in Wisconsin in a hilly farm area, and we wanted uh, the, the reenactors to come crashing down the hill as, as they were being shot by the Union mm -hmm. soldiers. And, and they would they would do this and, and get shot and do these somersaults. And, and, and the film crew, the film crew and I, we, we were getting worried, are these guys going to hurt each other, right. or hurt themselves? Right. And, the, and, and uh, they said, oh, even when there's not a film crew, they do this stuff for fun anyway. So even if we're not there shooting, <laughs> they would have done they're, they're it anyway, out there right? you know, doing somersaults down the hill pretending <laughs> that they were shot. Uh, I hope you didn't have to take too many takes of that uh, somersaulting down the, the hill. No, but they, it, we were amazed, at the, you know, especially we'd go back and we'd look at the, the footage and we'd say, boy, it's just amazing that this guy, <laughs> they died so well. But I guess they practice a lot. Yeah. Um, it's sort of an odd thing to think about that you practice dying. But at any rate, um, anyway. coming back to, to the great-grandparents, 
Um, what prompted you initially? Is it the fact that your family read these letters and it still came down to you, or did you, you alluded earlier to the idea that the story had kind of faded, but you had been able to rejuvenate well, it. Well, I first learned about the story when I was eight years old back in uh, 1961. My grandmother had uh, typed copies of the letters. Mm -hmm. uh, when her sister had typed them in the 1920s and 30s, she made a carbon copy set, which ended up in the hands of my mm -hmm. uh, grandmother. And uh, 1961 was the 100 year anniversary of the start of the Civil War. And uh, there were all sorts of articles in the, in the newspapers, the Des Moines Register in particular, mm -hmm. and um, I used to make Civil War scrapbooks. So, uh, so I knew about these when I was eight years old. And then go forward many years, my older son was in junior high school, and uh, his teacher said to me, why don't you help your, your son with some sort of a history project? So I, I uh, said, okay, and, I, and I, at that point mm -hmm. I, I got the carbon copy letters from my father, and I reread the letters as an adult and I just fell in love with them, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still and so, in love with them. So that's what, that's what started it. That's what started it. So have you been able to, to find the original handwritten letters? Are those, do those exist? Yes, I did, and um, it was actually my, my father kept urging me. I, I, I fell in love with Jacob's letters, and I uh, said, you know, I'm, I'm going to have these published, and my father said, uh, well, before you have them published, you really should find the original handwritten letters, and I said, mm -hmm. okay, where are they? And he said uh, he didn't know, but maybe his cousin Martha Lou had them. And I said, Where does Mar you know, where's Martha Lou? And he said, well, Martha Lou lives on a turkey farm up in North Dakota. Somewhere. It, at least she did 25 <laughs> or 30 years ago. <laughs> Why don't you find her? So we had this conversation about five times, it may, maybe more, and I would just kind of roll my eyes. And finally, I decided I would try to find Martha Lou, mostly to satisfy my father just to say, okay, mm -hmm. I tried. And uh, at the time, uh, I got a, a CD-ROM phone book in the United States, and uh, they had a listing by state, and her mm -hmm. last name was Bugby. So I got a list of all the, the Bugbys uh, in North Dakota and Minnesota, and I was planning to spend uh, a whole weekend going through this list of, uh, of Bugbys. And the, the very first phone call I made, uh, a woman answered the phone, and I uh, said, hello, I'm looking for a woman named Martha Lou Bugby. And the woman said, I'm Martha Lou Bugby. So I, the I got first her. The, call. the very first call I got her. And I started to explain what I was doing. And it turned out Martha Lou and her husband had recently moved off the turkey farm into a senior citizen's uh, center. Underneath her bed in the senior citizen's home, she had a box of old family Civil War letters. <laughs> wow. So, so, and she immediately sent those to me. Well, it turned out uh, that was a second set of letters, that, that, uh, different from Jacob's wartime letters. There were letters from Jacob before the war and after the war and other family correspondence. So I, I'd found a second set of letters, uh, but, but not, not Jacob's original. Ones. Right. Um, so I kept looking for Jacob's letters and uh, following some notes that my grandmother's sister had written in the 1950s, uh, someone had advised her to donate the letters to a local historical society. So I started making calls and uh, um, I went to the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. So just in being complete, um, I called up the Iowa Historical Society and I said, this is a shot in the dark. I'm, I'm just trying to cover bases. Here's what I'm looking for. and. Um, the guy says, I don't think we have them, but I'll, I'll, call, I'll check and I'll call you back mm -hmm. tomorrow. And he called back uh, the next day and said, you're not going to believe this, but we have Jacob's letters. And, and part of what makes that story exciting was uh, I went to the University of Iowa. My apartment, my last two years in Iowa City, was two blocks from the Historical <laughs> Society. So, so, so for two years in the 1970s. You were right there, but didn't I, know. I didn't know. For two years, I walked by Jacob's letters <laughs> every day on my way to class and mm. didn't know about it. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, and, and maybe it, it is it's fate or whatever, but that once you decided to start pursuing it, that these things fell into place. I mean, I know that's common. People always talk about how once you make the decision, things start to happen. But here's a real case with the, you know, the visit from the grave, as it were. Uh, and here, you know, the first phone call leading you to the, the second a, a, a lot of, of letters. Many, many strange things uh, have happened. One, one, of my, uh, one of my ghost stories is about an escaped slave. Mm -hmm. who's 10 or 12 years old. Um, 
uh, J Jacob talks about him. And uh, back when I was doing a lot of promotions with the book, I would tell the story how uh, they were on their way uh, down towards Vicksburg. And uh, in the evening, a, a young black boy came out and uh, told the Union soldiers that uh, there are about 25 uh, women, men and children, uh, chained up in a cane break. So Jacob and some of the soldiers went out and investigated and found the uh, escaped slaves and freed them. So I'd thought about this young boy, uh, this young black kid, uh, many times. I didn't know his name. About two years after the book came out, I learned his name, which was Pomp. And, and what, what happened was uh, the, uh, the chaplain of the 25th Iowa Infantry was a man named Thomas Corkill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back to my childhood in, in Sioux City, I grew up in Sioux City, which is western Iowa, 350 miles away from Mount Pleasant. I live in Chicago now. Chicago is a lot closer to Mount Pleasant, Iowa, than, than Sioux City. City is. Okay, so mm -hmm. 350 miles away in Sioux City. When I was in high school, uh, there was a student a year younger than me who lived right next door to one of my best friends. Uh, the student's name was Jimmy Corkill, the same last name mm -hmm. as Reverend Thomas Corkill. So I, I contacted this Jimmy Corkill uh, and said, you know, any chance that you're related to this Reverend Thomas Corkill of the 25th Iowa Infantry? And, and Jimmy said, yes, he was my <laughs> great, great grandfather. And not only that, but Jimmy had a copy of his great, great grandfather's diary. And, and Reverend Corkill told the same story as Jacob, just different details, including the name of this, this young escaped slave. Wow. Uh, it, it is, as I say, it's remarkable how these things come together once you start looking. And, and it makes us, it makes me wonder, certainly, how much history is out there that we have lost because someone like you didn't exist and didn't look into it. I, I, I think these coincidences happen to people all the time, only people don't pick up on them. And, and somehow I've been very, very lucky in picking up on these coincidences, you know, finding people, you know, somehow bumping into people and starting the conversation and making these connections. So um, we only have about two minutes left. I want to make sure that we mention that people who want to know more about this, that you have a website that they can visit, yeah, right? The, the, the website, www.loveandvalor.com. We also have a, a Facebook page, Love and Valor. And the, the, um, uh, the movie is available through PBS? As right, well? right. The movie is being distributed by PBS. Okay, and so and the book is on Amazon. Yeah, and it's, right. it's every book in creation, except the ones right. that, where the Amazon's angry at the publisher, right? right? Or, except except Amazon's not mad at me right now. So oh, that, that's good. Yeah. Right, right. So, um, uh, how does this how does this affect you? Uh, how, how are you different now, well, having looked into this? I, I recently had a discussion with a relative on the. Uh, Jacob lived his life on a very high plane, and uh, he's very much a person to emulate. So I, I think I become a better person knowing Jacob Rittner in the way that I have, knowing my great-great-grandfather. Uh, and, and knowing the, the things that motivated him and motivated even the people at that time. I, I think so. And, and, and just the people back then, they had a different perspective on life. They had a different perspective on the United States, that, uh, that this is part of this Western movement. Um, one of the things with comparing a, a love and valor to a cold mountain, Jacob Rittner very much loved the Union he felt it was a blessing by God. And uh, so he had feelings for the country that most people don't have today. And that would be really nice if we could resuscitate for, especially in it, today's day and age. Absolutely. And on that note, we're out of time. Okay, well, thank you very much. So uh, thank you so much for coming out. It's a fascinating story. So we've been visiting with uh, Charlie Larimer and his book and movie, Love and Valor. I'm Kevin McDermott. You've been watching Public Perspective. You can see us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19. And you can find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So until next time, thank you and good night. So stay tuned.